I built this house in uh, 2000, and uh, f that field, they gave me a bill for $150,000 to, to do landscaping. And one of my neighbors plants vineyards, <clears throat> and his, his bill to put a vineyard there was zero. The deal was, he puts a vineyard there, he takes care of it, and then he gets the grapes, and I get to have a vineyard in my backyard. The first year that we got grapes was in 1996, and we told him, um, we're going to keep the grapes just this year, just so we were kind of intrigued. We wanted to see what would it be like to make wine. So we had one little barrel of wine that we put back in the corner, and every weekend we'd go out and see if it needed anything. And ironically, that wine is still today tasting superbly. So uh, after that, the next year, we said, no, you can't have the grapes. And he said, I knew I was never getting those grapes. <laughs> so I'm the technical guy, and I also like making things. So I built our wineries, I built the caves, I built this winery out here, and I build wine equipment. So I, I decide how I want to make wine, and then I make custom equipment to make wine. What we decided in the beginning was to put the entire winery in caves instead of just the barrel cave. Um, because first of all, they're very big and it was um, an artistically better way to put the vineyard or the uh, winery in this particular vineyard. So it's a gravity flow winery. We're at the top cave, fermentation cave, which drops down to the barrel cave, then drops down to the bottling cave. The floor of every cave is just the height it needs to be from the next cave in order to get the wine to flow by gravity. And I started designing the cave, and that uh, I worked on it uh, four hours every Saturday and Sunday for three years. And I had to learn how to um, do caves. They're, they're not simple. <clears throat> and I actually learned about that uh, from, from a, a, an Austrian cave builder. And I designed the caves, I des and I basically I designed the winery, and then I built the caves to fit around the winery. This is a fermentation cave. The way that um, the caves work is the um, fruit comes in by hand in the yellow bins. We sort the fruit by hand. The fruit goes directly into the tank that we ferment in. So we don't have any fancy you know, mechanisms on the tank, just an inlet for the jacket for cooling or heating and an outlet. So the fruit gets put into the tank, the tank gets put into the station. The station has everything that it needs to support the ferment. So it has cold water, hot water, warm water, uh, argon, oxygen, and um, electricity, and that's it. That's all we need, because what we do when we ferment is we, the way we make the wine is very old fashioned, traditional, and the way we monitor the wine is very high tech. Fermenters you buy, every piece of equipment has an implied process, that is, you use the equipment by pushing buttons and turning things on and off. And therefore, when you buy a piece of equipment, you've also bought a way of making wine. And I wanted to make my wine paradoxically by the ancient method. So if, if you go back to Burgundy in the 1830s, uh, there was a winemaker named Ouvrard who ran Romani Conti, and the process was very simple. In winemaking, if you have 100% grapes, you can make 100% wine. Now you can mess up the wine, you can have 100% grapes and make 50% wine, but basically winemaking you can make as good a wine as you have grapes. So what I've our process is simple, foot crushing, native yeast, etc. And we think we get the 100% on the, on the grapes. So to, the, to, to, to that point then, it doesn't kind of matter what shape your fermenter is or how it works. So my fermenter is really very simple. So we got into that, and, and but the, the, the fermentation was simple. Open fermenter, like a barrel, no valves, no doors, no man doors, no pumps, nothing. It's just a, a container. And then we, so we use stainless steel instead of wood. But other than that, it's a very simple fermenter and we crush grapes by feet. 
So when you're fermenting, um, if you've ever gone into a winery and you smell that beautiful smell of uh, a winery under fermentation during harvest, those are all of the volatile uh, coming off of a fermentation. And what we've learned is we can capture those um, with the aroma recovery machine. And these were designed here in America uh, with a company called Therma. TJ and one of their engineers just got together. And basically it condenses the alcohols that come off during fermentation and it um, drops them into bottles at the bottom. And the aromas are very pretty. They're flowery and vanilla and uh, sometimes taffy. So they're very beautiful. The other one I wanted to mention is um, even though we are perceived to be a high-tech winery in that you might think we make the wine in a high-tech manner, we don't. We actually make the wine in a super old-fashioned way, just like the ancients. We monitor in a high-tech way. So we still do whole cluster, um, native yeast, all, all the things they did way back when um, for as gentle um, process of the Pinot Noir as you can possibly make it. So um, we store shiners because we age our wine two years before we release it to market. So when we pull it out of storage um, and we're getting ready to label it, it looks like this. The first step is putting the capsule on and then we move to put the label on. It, and this is also pretty manual. Um, it's just a one label at a time machine. And then after the front and back label get put on, we go to the neck label. It's put on manually. Just pull the... Uh, neck label off and put it on and try and do the best you can to get it nice and centered. And then the next step is to put the wax in. We have a mold that we had designed. This actually, it may not look high tech, but it took us a long time to get it right. It's the shape of the bottle, but the wax doesn't stick to it, so it's a Teflon. So you put it on the neck of the label, then you take your little bowl of wax and you pour it in and you wait for a second, and then you take your little silicon vacuum, you take the chip, and then you put it in the wax, and then you twist the mold off, and you got a wax on the neck with the chip. We're having really good luck. Um, one of the things about our winemaking style is it's very different than most Pinot Noir makers. Uh, we're, we're of a Burgundian um, winemaking technique. Well, we do whole clusters, we do native yeast, we don't filter, we are gravity flow, foot crushed. That causes the wine to be a much bigger, bolder Pinot Noir, a lot like the old style Burgundies, not the new style Burgundies, which are much lighter and ready to drink um, earlier. We never developed our business plan necessarily to be profitable. So we never looked at it in terms of numbers because if you do, men, sometimes you will have to make decisions uh, relative to uh, the cost. And TJ believes, um, which is totally different than the way he runs Cyprus, that he doesn't want that to hold him back because you know it's more uh, no expense spared. All decisions are made with the end uh, decision being the quality of the wine. What, what can we do? How can we do it? And why do we do it in order to make the wine better? And that's all that matters. And that causes a lot of decisions to be made which are economically usually infeasible. The way we release our wine, we have a, um, a we, we release once a year and uh, we let everybody know, okay, the 2010 vintage is out. And then all of our customers, our mailing list, because they're allocated, they take their allocation, and then what's left over, we do, and we actually, not what's left over, we actually hold back supply. And the reason we do that is because we're trying to, get, we need to increase our mailing list to uh, account for the uh, uh, increased production in the future. So we have a release party at our store in Half Moon Bay, and then, then that we put on Facebook and Twitter and all that. Online sales of wine is a part of a general trend, and that is online sales of everything and that is, has changed the world and will continue to change the world. Most of our sales are direct to con, uh, consumer online. It's not in my genes to be um, a marketer. I find, you know, it's, it, it reminds me of it, when someone tells you your baby's ugly. 
it, I can't take it. <laughs> so, you know, we, you know, I, I live and breathe this, this wine. And for someone to say they don't like it, it, it just really hurts my feelings. <laughs> you know, and you can't please everybody all the time, right? So um, we decided that Valida can't do marketing. So we're gonna hire somebody to do it. And, and TJ's actually been on me for years. And I just haven't had the, the urge to do it. And last year, um, I said, okay, fine. I'll go out and I interviewed a bunch of people and decided what style of marketeer I wanted. Instead of going with one person to hire in the corporation as the marketing person, I hired a company to keep them as consultants. So they're kind of like arm's length. And what they do is they do all of our PR, they do all of our wine submissions, and more. it's more um, they find the right person to review the wine who has like a lot of followers, understand Pinot Noir, and and then they're also, uh, they, they based, I think, on our request, because I wanted to keep my marketing and my distribution together so that the same people marketing me are, are the same people who care about who's carrying my wine. So then uh, they have a distribution branch. So they're now working, helping us with distribution as well. Because TJ wants to be in the best restaurants around the world, now around the country for now. And you can't be in restaurants in other states unless you go through a distributor. I think the story matters a great deal because even for us, the story matters. When we go to a restaurant and we, we meet the owner and the chef and then we hear his story, I mean, we're, we're locked in. You know, we go there because of that story. And so we hope that our story is such that it's uh, interesting enough that it will draw people in and people will want to, you know, be a part of it. Because, you know, we're still pretty young. And, you know, if, if, if you start, you know, on the ground floor with a story, then you grow with them. And, you know, we have customers who have been our customers since 2000. And I don't think they'd miss placing an order ever just because they want to make sure they're still part of that story. So I, I do think that's important. And it's a fun story, you know. And TJ's, you know, a very interesting guy to follow. And everybody knows based on what they know about him working at Cyprus and the level of expectation he has for perfection, if he's associated with Clodal Tech, they know that that's gonna spill over in the way that he makes the wine here. I think wine is really good right now. You, people have different style choices. So, you know, some people like the Parker wine, the heavy ripe wines, and some people like the European style wines. But given your taste, each of those wines is made very well. And, and so I, I think the amount of good wine available today is the best it's ever been.